G'day. I'm just figuring eventually you'll all be able to say g'day. Like you're, you know, like you, you come from Australia. Uh, if we haven't met, uh, I'm John Dixon. Oh, my name just went. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually on staff here. Uh, I'm just a ring-in. Uh, but uh, I am a, a, a good mate of your pastor, Jeff. And as a result, I keep on getting these invitations to preach here, which is, which is fine by me. Um, <laughs> and I'm particularly grateful uh, that, that Pastor Brian uh, asked me to do three weeks in a row. Three weeks in a row through Philippians. So, uh, uh, Huge, huge thanks. Um, We're going to hear from the Bible in a moment, but before that, uh, do you know the name Sir Edmund Hillary? Okay, cool. The most famous New Zealander ever, probably, who with Tenzin Norgay, his Sherpa guide, was the first to summit the highest point on earth. They together conquered Mount Everest in May 1953. It was worldwide front page news because people were astonished they could actually pull it off. People thought it was actually impossible for humans to do it with the very limited gear that they had in 1953. But they did it and it catapulted the name Sir Edmund Hillary around the world. What is less well known is that Ed Hillary um, devoted himself from that point on to serving the people of Nepal. Uh, Nepal had given him so many things, worldwide fame, open doors wherever he went, a knighthood from the queen and so on. And so he wanted to give back. And he spent his decades uh, building hospitals and schools and orphanages back in Nepal to just give back to others. And on one of these charity trips, very late in life, when he was quite an elderly gentleman, he was at the base camp of Everest, just uh, raising money, and some tourist climbers were walking past him and went, hang on, that's, that's Edmund Hillary. And they all gathered around him, 10 or 15 of them gathered around him to get a photo with the first man to conquer Mount Everest. And then as they were setting up the photo, they gave him an ice axe, you know? And uh, then another tourist climber walked by and didn't recognise Sir Edmund Hillary and had the audacity to actually say to Edmund Hillary, excuse me, that's not how you hold an ice axe. (laughs) Here, let me show you. And to everyone's stunned amazement, Ed Hillary just let him adjust the group and thanked the man very much for his advice and went on with the photo. Man, if I were in that group, I would have gone, you idiot, (laughs) do you know who this is? Anyway, but not Ed Hillary. So here's the thing that not many people know about him. The man who conquered the highest point in the world was renowned, actually, by those who knew him, for humility. Never promoting himself. Always serving others. That's a pretty good definition of humility, actually. And the reason I'm telling you that is because our passage today, which we'll hear in a moment, is arguably the most important text ever on the topic of humility. It is certainly a revolution. This is the first text we can date to elevate humility as like the chief of the virtues. It's a revolution. And what is um, a well-kept secret is that in the ancient Greek and Roman world in which the apostle Paul lived and worked, the word humility was not a virtue. Actually, the word just meant low to the ground. Not virtuous at all. A little bit of history, never hurt anyone. So let's watch the screen. Even in Greece, perhaps the most ethically self-aware of all ancient cultures, humility played no part in the good life. Delphi was seen as the spiritual center of the world. And the so-called maxims of Delphi were the epitome of Greek moral wisdom. The Delphic maxims are a summary of the good life in pithy form, just two or three words each. Know yourself. Actually, these words were inscribed on the temple behind me. Help your friends. Nothing to excess. Stop yourself killing. That's good advice. Honour good people. Meet out justice. Don't mock the dead. And 
don't let your reputation go. And on it goes for 147 lines. What's especially interesting is what's missing from the maxims. 147 pieces of moral advice and not even a hint of the ethic of humility we're so used to today. Humility in Greek and Roman ethics would be a, a degrading thing. To put yourself down to a level that you were not born to or that your standing in life did not require you to be in was disgraceful and debasing. There was no virtue in it at all. So what happened? How did the West come to despise honour seeking and prize humility? The evidence points firmly in one direction. Jesus of Nazareth. It's true that Jesus taught an ethic of humility. He once said, whoever wants to be great must be your servant. But it probably wasn't his teaching that changed things decisively. It was his death. It's difficult today to grasp just how much of a catastrophe Jesus' crucifixion was to those who loved him. To hear that a Messiah, a great king, uh, a, an important person was crucified, well, it would be nonsense to the Greek or the Roman ear. It couldn't make sense of it. In fact, Roman citizens were not crucified for that very reason. It was just so shameful. So for the gospel message to proclaim a crucified Lord, it, it upended the value system that the Romans held. That's a pretty good summary of what Paul is doing in the letter to the Philippians, upending the value system that the Romans held. You might remember last week, this was pretty explicit. We looked at what is the first command of the whole epistle. And I argued last week, the central command of the whole epistle. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And I pointed out, if you were here last week, you'll remember this, that the words, the five words, uh, conduct yourselves in a manner, actually translate one Greek verb that is virtually untranslatable because we don't have an English equivalent. It's the word polytueste. Polytueste gives us the word politics. And it's actually the word for citizen in verb, right? We don't have that. You don't citizenize. I mean, it's not a word we use, but that's what he's saying. Conduct yourselves in a manner is just whatever happens, citizenize, worthy of the gospel of Christ. And for people in the Roman world, this word polytues there was a special word that basically meant live the life of a good Roman citizen. And yet here is Paul saying, citizenize, worthy not of Caesar, but of Jesus. What I didn't say last week is that even the word gospel that Paul uses here and that we're so used to was not first and foremost a religious word in the time Paul wrote this letter. Uh, you may or may not know that the word gospel was the word often used for announcements about the emperor. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. Here's a really famous inscription from 9 BC, just before Jesus, that uh, is all about Caesar Augustus. The gods sent Caesar Augustus as a savior for us and for those who come after us to make war to cease, to create peaceful order everywhere. And the birth of the divine Augustus marked the beginning of gospels for the world. This inscription is saying that Augustus was Rome's Saviour, he brought peaceful order into the Roman world, which basically meant he crushed everyone. That's the peaceful order that the, Rome, the Romans liked. You talk about the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, basically destroying everyone who, who didn't do what the Romans wanted to do. Uh, but, but in that sense, he's the, he's the Saviour. And that's his gospel. That's the gospel of Caesar. And this is the same Caesar, Augustus, who, as I said last week, elevated Philippi, our little town, to the status of Roman colony, which made it a little Rome with special privileges other towns didn't have, tax benefits, benefactions from the emperor himself, free land for retiring soldiers. So to be in Philippi, you thought pretty highly of yourself. 
And in this context, Paul says, citizenize, worthy of the gospel, not of Caesar, but of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Caesar was all about power. The gospel of Christ, all about suffering, service, humility. And in our passage today, in case you were wondering if I was gonna get there after all, Paul begins to apply this thought. What does it mean to citizenize worthy of the gospel? To live according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel of the Caesars. And we're gonna see, principally, it means be active in serving others. Our passage, as you'll hear, opens with a therefore. Chapter two, verse one, therefore. Because this passage now unpacks what it means to live by the gospel of Christ. Thanks, Blake. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thanks, Blake. You can see we're gonna land on the topic of humility, Christ's humility and our call to humility. But before Paul gets there, he begins with what looks like a reference, an allusion at least, to the Trinity. The Trinity, that weird doctrine Christians have always taught that God, the one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And many scholars detect this in the opening lines. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united to, uh, to Christ, that's clearly God the Son. And then the, the third line, uh, if any common sharing in the Spirit, is clearly God the Holy Spirit. But actually, when you think of it like this, Scholars detect that the middle line, comfort from his love, is not the love of Christ, but the love of the Father. Because throughout Paul's letters, mostly the love of God is associated with the love of the Father who sent the Son into the world. Son, Father, Spirit. A reference to the Trinity. We get a very similar list of blessings in 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 13. Some of you may, may know this. Uh, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, and the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship or sharing, same word, in the Holy Spirit be with you all. Son, Father, Spirit. Son, Father, Spirit. Here, Paul alludes to the Trinity before he starts to teach the Philippians about our community. Now, I know you may think, hang on, that. That's really weird. That, that's too much technical detail. That's the sort of thing that should just be locked up at Wheaton College in a box and you don't bring it to church. But I actually think it's powerful. He's saying that the Trinity is the true source of Christian community. And yes, the Trinity messes with our heads mathematically. If any of you are into maths, it's hard to work out how three is one and one is three. You ask Christian, is God three or one? And the Christian says, yes. And, and, and some skeptics have a field day on this. One of my favorite podcasts is by the BBC. It's called In Our Time. 
awesome history podcast. And Melvin Bragg is an atheist, and in his podcast that's sort of about the Trinity, he described the Trinity as that muddle Christians got themselves into. It's not very friendly, but I guess some Christians may feel that as well. But actually, our Muslim neighbours go even further. They describe the Trinity this way. Chapter 5 of the Quran, they do blaspheme who say, God is one of three in a trinity, for there is no God except one. So uh, I want to admit to you that the doctrine of the trinity messes with our head mathematically. Okay, but it also answers a way more profound question. There is a profound philosophical question about the nature of reality, about the nature of God, that people have puzzled over. Here's the question. How can God be essentially and eternally loving if there was no other, no beloved in eternity to love or be loved by? You may never have put it that way, but how is love an essential character of God if in eternity there was no one to love? Was God only potentially love in eternity before he had the great thought of making us? And then, oh, finally, someone to love. No, well, the Trinity answers this question because the Trinity says God is eternally in his very nature. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit in a love relationship that is eternal and essential. And it guarantees for us that community, unity in diversity is eternal in God. And it's out of this doctrine of the tri-unity, the trinity of God, that Christians get their massive emphasis on community. The second thing Paul touches on. Look at all the ways Paul emphasizes unity in diversity. I love this. He goes, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition, be humble, etc. Do you see those four expressions? Uh, Like-minded, same love, one in spirit, one of mind. You might try and unpack those four things, but I just reckon he's doing what every preacher does. Repeats himself until he thinks he's being understood. He repeats himself until he's being understood. He repeats himself until he's being understood. Okay. (laughs) Just four ways of saying the same thing. He's saying, you are diverse, but you are one in Christ. Just as the Trinity is eternally three persons and yet one in love. Will you please be one in love? That's what he's saying. And I reckon this had special resonance in Philippi of all places because we actually know how the church at Philippi was founded. The cool thing about the New Testament is we have a book called the Book of Acts, which narrates the history of the beginning of the church from the resurrection of Jesus to the first 30 years. So you get all the churches being planted in Thessalonica and Athens and Philippi and so on. So all these letters we have to the churches are written after the founding of these churches. So we know what happened in Acts chapter 16. When Paul went to Philippi, The first converts were from radically diverse social settings. Here's a little epitome of it. Well worth reading the whole of Acts 16 yourself, but I just want to point out that they they traveled to Philippi. The first person to become a Christian is Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. That puts her in the wealthy category in Philippi. Purple cloth is pretty wealthy stuff. She's a businesswoman, independent businesswoman. But look at the second convert a female slave with an evil spirit. That is the very bottom of Roman society. Look at the third convert. It's the jailer who locked up Paul. And very cool things happen in Acts 16. So you should go and read that. But then the jailer goes, oh, I wanna become a Christian now. And he and his whole family get baptised. It's awesome. But my point is this. We know The 10 years before Paul wrote this letter, this church was very diverse. They had someone who was an independent businesswoman. Then they had a jailer in his household and they had someone at the very bottom of Roman society, a slave. You imagine 10 years later, they've all begun to bring their friends and family to church. 
by the time Paul writes to them, they are potentially a mess. It's amazing that they don't seem to be a complete mess. They are a church of love. And this didn't happen in the Roman world. There is nowhere else in the Roman world that an independent businesswoman could sit next to a slave girl and say, we are sisters. Historians often point this out. Um, you may have never heard the name Peter Brown, but in history circles, he's at the very top of the tree. He's from Princeton. And he says this was one of the key factors in the extraordinary growth of Christianity. He describes it as the Christian community offered a social and moral urban lung. What he means is all the tensions and stresses of living in such a hierarchical society as Rome, when, when you came into church together, when you were family together, everyone could breathe an urban lung a place where the competition amongst the rich was settled. The stresses of the very poor and enslaved disappeared. The strains of the middle who wanted to avoid going down and longed to go up, those strains diminished somewhat. An urban lung. May we, Chapel Street, be a place where everyone can breathe. <sighs> where the competitions and bigotries and elitism of our culture disappear once we're in fellowship with one another. Community. For all the mistakes that the church has made over the years, I can't deny those mistakes. But for all those mistakes, the, the hard data still suggests the church around the world is still the, the one place where this bridging social capital can take place. I'm not making this up. Um, in Australia, this is true. Here is Andrew Lee. You may have never heard of him, but he's actually a government minister. Secretary, you call them. Um, he's an atheist. He's a professor from the univers National University in Australia. But he's also now the Assistant Secretary for Competition, Charities and Treasury. But he's an expert on what fosters community in Australian society. He did his, did his PhD in it. Actually, he did his PhD at Harvard. Um, but he's written this amazing book. And in his chapter on religion, despite being an atheist, he writes these words. Regular churchgoers are 16 percentage points more likely to have been involved in a voluntary activity. 22 percentage points more likely to have helped the needy. Those who attend church regularly are more likely to say that they can count among their friends a business owner, Lydia, a manual worker, the jailer, or a welfare recipient. The slave girl. Few other institutions are as effective in fostering this bridging social capital between rich and poor. As I said, he did his PhD at Harvard where his um, supervisor was this man, Robert Putnam. I'm amazed how few American Christians have read Robert Putnam's work. He, he also is not a Christian, but his book, American Grace, is a massive study that was repeated because the results were so crazy. He had to repeat the study and got the same results that found that really the heartbeat of community in America is the church. May the unity of the Trinity show itself in our loving community. That said, the church mustn't just be a social club. For all this stuff, I don't wanna just say, hey, you know, let's just help the poor and look after each other, yay. Because the church is way more than that. What grounds our community ought to be worship of Christ's divinity. My third point. 
Paul really emphasizes this. In your relationships with one another, verse five, have the same mindset or thinking as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but made himself nothing. Now, you notice on the screen, I've indented verses six to 11. Uh, I did this because those of you who have real Bibles, uh, I, I don't know if Bible apps do this, but real like physical Bibles, they do this. They indent those verses, six to 11. In fact, they put them in two stanzas. And on the far right of the screen, you can see the Greek text that, that's, that scholars use for their translating of the New Testament. And you can see, can't you, that the Greek text indents these verses. Why? Because this is likely a Christian hymn. The language is exalted. The rhythm is, is quite um, obviously poetic. And Paul suddenly breaks into a hymn to Christ as God. Now, as soon as I say that, it, it reminds me of some evidence we have from a non-Christian governor from the ancient world who persecuted Christians terribly in what we call Turkey. Uh, governor Pliny writes to Emperor Trajan about his persecuting Christians. And he says, I'm trying to work out what's wrong with the Christians. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm killing them, I'm torturing them, but I still can't work out what's wrong. So if you could give me some advice. It's a hilarious letter. Here's a tiny little portion about the only thing he could find about the Christians. Here it is. It was all the more necessary to extract the truth by torture from two slave women whom they called deaconesses. The sum total of their guilt or error amounted to no more than this. They had met regularly before dawn on a determined day and sung antiphonally a hymn to Christ as God. So many fun things here. If this were a lecture, I'd go nuts about how crazy that there are these women who are slaves, who are nonetheless ministers, deaconesses in the church. And Pliny thought, let's get information about Christianity from them. That's crazy. The time of church is also weird, isn't it? What time is church? Some people complain about the 8 a.m. service here. <laughs> church, church here was, be, was before dawn. But the other cool thing, and the thing I really wanna focus on, is they sung antiphonally a hymn to Christ as God. You know what antiphonal singing is? It's when this side of the room goes, Kumbaya, my Lord. And this side goes. And then this side goes. Kumbaya, my Lord. Okay, we could maybe work on that a little. <laughs> but the point is they sang a hymn to Christ as God. And as soon as you hear that early evidence, you go, here's a hymn to Christ as God in the New Testament. We have one. Christians worshipped Jesus as divine. That first stanza says that he is in very nature God. And he didn't consider that equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. No, he emptied himself, became a servant, humbled himself all the way to the cross. But after his death, the second stanza says he is raised straight back up to divine status. God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name. Now, just to be clear, that isn't the name Jesus, right? The name of every name isn't Jesus. Did you know every seventh boy was called Jesus in Palestine? It's a really super common name back then. No, it's the name Lord. It's the divine name. And then verses 10 and 11 do a really cool thing. Focus on this because what this hymn does is say of Jesus what was only ever said of God Almighty in the Old Testament, yeah? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and then verse 11, and every tongue acknowledge that he is Lord. Now, why is that so important? Because it's a rephrasing of a famous Old Testament passage. There it is, Isaiah 45. 
where the Lord God himself says, before me, every knee will bow. Every tongue will acknowledge me. And now these lines in Philippians say, yes, because Jesus is God. Fully divine. And the reason I'm saying this is that all this stuff about love and community is ultimately the overflow of our worship of Jesus Christ. If we want to be fashioned into a genuine Christian community rather than just like a social club or a charity club, it must arise first and foremost from our worship of Jesus Christ, Lord and God. That's what supercharges Christian community. Only then will we be formed by the mind of Jesus Christ, which is a mind of humility, my fourth and final point. The most extraordinary thing about this hymn is not that Christians worship Jesus as God. That's great to know, it's theologically important, but the most extraordinary thing about this hymn is that in the one breath, the early Christians could sing, he is in very nature God and very nature of a servant. Do you see that? It's an obvious parallel. And then more than that, he humbled himself all the way to death on a cross. Contemplate this. Christians could say in the same breath, God cross. The highest being, the source of being on the lowest point of the Roman world, a shameful cross. Humility, as we saw in the video, was not a virtue in Greece and Rome prior to this. Of course, humility before the emperor was valuable because the emperor could kill you. So you always abase yourself, you lower yourself before the emperor. But humility before an equal didn't make sense. Humility before a lesser was obscene. The idea that Lydia would humble herself before the slave girl's nuts. So the thing is, humility wasn't even a part of Greek and Roman social ethics, let alone a description of what God could be like. But here this hymn is saying, God is humble. The Lord God became a servant and served us Absolute majesty, humbly serving us. And here, friends, is our definition of humility. Humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. People often get this confused. Do you think Jesus thought less of himself? Think Jesus walked around with low self-esteem? No, I think he walked around going, yeah, I made that. I made that. I hold your breath in every moment. The thing is, he deliberately lowered himself though, redirected all of his power to serve others. Humility is being active in serving, passive in self-promoting. And as soon as you spot that, you spot that it's the very structure of the hymn each stanza is very carefully composed. The first stanza, Jesus is entirely active in serving. Do you see? He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He made himself nothing. No one made him nothing. Um, he humbled himself. No one humbled him. He obeyed all the way to a cross. No one made him. He is active in serving. But here's the kicker. The second stanza where he's exalted, he does nothing. Notice it doesn't say, therefore he exalted himself. What does it say? Therefore God the Father exalted him. It doesn't say he took the name to himself that it was about. No, the Father bestowed on him the name. Do you see this? Active in serving, passive in self-promoting. And as soon as you spot that about the Lord, it opens up those lines you might have noticed I skipped over 
that introduced the hymn. Because Paul is basically saying, we've got to be the same. Active in serving, passive in self-promoting. Here it is. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Passive in self-promoting. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Active in serving. Not looking to your own interests. Passive in self-promoting. But each of you to the interests of others. Active in serving. And then he links it to Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind, the same thoughts as Jesus Christ. Humility, friends, is not just one virtue among many. Humility is the very mind of Jesus Christ. It is the very content of our gospel of the crucified and risen Lord. Humility is the very shape of Christian community. As we actively serve, but are passive when it comes to self-promotion. Our gospel is not about getting our own way and then forcing our way on others. That's the gospel of Caesar. Our gospel is about a cross. The highest Lord coming to the lowest place. Roman crucifixion. For our sake. Because he loves us. There is a little known fact about Sir Edmund Hillary but it's a fact he tells in his own account of conquering Everest. Did you know he took with him one extra item? A little crucifix, a little cross. And when he got to the top of the world, he says, when he summited, he knelt down in the snow, took out the cross and buried it in the snow at the top of the world. I love this. No one's ever found it since. But somewhere at the top of earth is a cross. What a lovely reminder of our gospel. The highest Lord came to the lowest point. What a reminder of the life that Christ calls of us to be active in service, passive in self-promotion. So friends, as we pass through these strange and stressful times, as a church, but also as a larger society, let's give ourselves to Jesus Christ. Let's worship him and share his mind of humility to the glory of God. So Father, will you please in your mercy give us ears to hear and eyes to see, wills to put into practice your word. Write this your word on our hearts, we pray. Turn our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. And Lord, help us to share his mind for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God Almighty keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always.